I'm getting back into sourdough again. Um, I was really excited when this this happened and became so trendy because I've been trying to start a bread revolution in North America and now it's happening and everyone's appreciating and baking good bread. Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Piaro, editor of the magazine and host of the podcast. Leah Kirchman is one of the country's top riders. She is the current national time trial champion. In 2014, she was not only the TT champ, but she also had the Maple Leaf jersey for the road and the criterium. She's stood on many world tour podiums. For the past two months, the UCI has been moving toward the new racing calendar set to start in August. Things are changing quickly. Each new announcement seems to just give rise to more questions. For example, on June 19th, the UCI came out with some of its COVID-19 protocols, which involved a lot of talk about bubbles. Team bubbles, peloton bubbles. I wanted to know what that meant for a world tour rider like Kirchman. Kirchman might face some tough choices this season. Would she be able to race the inaugural women's Paris-Roubaix, if it happens? Or would she make a return to the tour of Chongmin Island? Could she defend her national time trial title and attend the Giro Rosa too? The rider, who has studied public health and nutrition and who is a passionate cook, also talked sourdough and salmon. Leah Kirchman, what can you tell me about your plans and your team's plans for the road season that's set to start in August? Uh, my team's been working really hard behind the scenes to to come up with a, a new plan for the alternative season. Um, you know, I'm still waiting for a lot of details and things could still change. But as of now, I'm probably going to head back to Europe uh, sometime in July to meet up for a small camp and and then we're kind of going to go from there. Which race are you maybe looking forward to or what race do you hope is on your schedule this year? I mean, it's it's hard to say. Um, I mean, I, I love for the world championships to happen. Um, that's always a big highlight of the year. So <laughs> hopefully that will happen and I'll, I'll be there with Team Canada. There, yeah, there's still so many um, unknowns and things are changing almost, almost, not quite daily, but they're changing a lot. And there's a, a lot of details that need to be worked out. Uh, two developments that happened in the last few weeks was that the uh, Vargarda West Sweden races and the Tour of Norway, the Ladies Tour of Norway, uh, were removed from the uh, rescheduled calendar. These are races that uh, you did quite well in last year. You're on the podium in the time trial in Sweden and uh, in the Tour of Norway. How do you feel about their absences from this year's schedule? Yeah, I'm quite sad to see them cancelled. Um, those are some of my favorite races. I just love the Scandinavian countries and yeah, they're, they're always really well organized races and you also get to eat salmon at like every meal. So that's <laughs> I really love that, and I don't know the nature there is also so beautiful, and it it kind of reminds me of Canada in some ways. So yeah, hopefully hope to be back there in the future when it's uh, safe to do so again. Sometimes they have like food prizes. So when we won the team time trial in twenty eighteen, there I think we won twenty five kilos of salmon. I was highly motivated for that race. That's awesome. We'll race harder for salmon. That's great. On June 19th, the UCI came out with its COVID-19 protocols for racing. They include the formation of team bubbles and peloton bubbles. Has there been discussion at your team, Team Sunweb, about how you will implement those protocols um, and how they might affect what you do? I'm still waiting to hear all the details from our team, but I know for sure that they've thought a lot about this. And actually, the the head of our medical team was also part of the group that was working with with the UCI on creating those those kind of protocols and procedures. So yeah, I expect that our, our team will have very specific rules to follow for every all the riders and all the staff to to make sure that we can resume operations safely. 
from about March until mid-May, you were still based in the Netherlands. What was uh, training and uh, the day-to-day like uh, in the Netherlands for you? When the pandemic started, um, a few of us decided to stay for the time being in the Netherlands. Um, it just felt safer to to not travel at that time. And, and we had a good setup and could kind of easily socially, iso- not socially, iso- physically isolate ourselves there. The day-to-day wasn't too different. So the Netherlands wasn't like, you know, Spain and Italy where they had the full lockdown. It was probably more similar to Canada. So encouraging physical distancing. A lot of businesses were closed. They had rules like the the maximum people that you could uh, ride with or be with outside is, was a group of three. So yeah, mostly I was just training alone or I was also training with um, Allison who was there during the same time. So it was, it was good. We at least had a few of us to keep each other company. Yeah, I was just um, grateful that I, I could still go outside to train during that time. Your teammate, Allison Jackson, was your neighbor in the Netherlands uh, she's a fellow Canadian on, on the team. What was it like being uh, her neighbor and training partner in mid to late spring? Yeah, it was it was great spending more time with Allison uh, during kind of the, that quarantine period in the spring. Um, I mean, she's just such a high energy person that it's kind of nonstop entertainment and <laughs> she's, she's always um yeah making jokes and and coming up with new entertaining ideas of things to do so yeah i, I enjoy uh spending time with allison did she help you with your tiktok game yeah i'm <laughs> i i think i got to feature in my first tiktok video in one of her posts so i've uh i'm learning about new technology and you have raced with allison in the past on in various arrangements but you haven't uh, yet raced with her on a, in a Sunweb project. Um, what are you looking forward to with respect to possibly uh, two Canadians working together uh, in a world tour race? Yeah, I mean, I'm really looking forward to when we can actually race together as as Sunweb. Yeah, Allison has a lot of strengths, and and if we can, you know, race effectively together, I think we can achieve some some really good results as as Canadians on the team. Um, and I think also the more times that we can race together uh, in world tour races, this will also translate to, you know, knowing each other even better for for things like the world championships when we're racing as Team Canada. What was your training like at that time? And even now, what what is your training like um, at the end of June? Yeah, I guess when when everything first happened, our coaches on the team worked to kind of adjust our whole training plan to reflect a, a potentially a new season. So working towards goals in the, the summer and the fall instead. So yeah, we just adjusted kind of all the periodization and went more into a maintenance kind of training phase. And then now it's it's a little bit more of a build. Um, we're still building towards this these potential races that are going to happen. It's kind of like everything was just pushed back by a few months for training. While you're in the Netherlands, what did you miss most uh, from Canada? I mean, uh, when I was in the Netherlands, um, it was probably just the most difficult to be away from all my friends and family in Canada while while there's all this uncertainty happening and you're just in a foreign country. Yeah, that was probably the most difficult thing. And what prompted you to come back to Canada? Yeah, I decided to come back because once we hit May, then there was a little bit of clarity with the new calendar. Before that, we, we really had no idea, but at least now there's some potential dates there with this revised um, yeah, race calendar. Um, and so... It also felt like it was maybe a a safer time to travel and that things were a little bit more controlled around that. Yeah, I decided to, to come back for and then at least spend a couple of months at home and, and take advantage of that opportunity. Off the bike, you are known for your baking and cooking skills. Actually, in fact, I've heard from some Canadian cycling magazine readers that your banana oat pancakes recipe is now their go-to uh, recipe on weekends. I will I will post that in the show notes. But um, 
what are some of the recipes you're working on now or what culinary adventures are you engaging in? <laughs> that's, uh, that's awesome to hear that my oat pancakes are uh, a family favorite now for, for many people. Yeah, I don't know. I'm always making new things. I just like to experiment. I did share some more recipes helping our team with a food Friday. So if people want some recipes, there, there is some posted on the team site. And right now, I'm getting back into sourdough again. Um, I was really excited when this, this happened and became so trendy because I've been trying to start a bread revolution in North America. And now it's happening and everyone's appreciating and baking good bread. So really excited about that. That's great. You were, you were into sourdough before it was cool. I love that. <laughs> Are there any other uh, projects that have been keeping you busy off the bike? I guess one fun thing is that I've got to plant a small garden. <laughs> um, some of our friends own um, a small a small hobby farm and gave me a small corner of their garden. So, you know, one thing when you're on the road a lot, you can't really own anything that's yeah own plants or things that require a lot of care so that's been kind of a, a little fun project for the moment returning to racing there are only uh, two races in the world tour calendar that conflict at the moment there's the tour of Chongming island and the new women's peri roubaix do you have a sense of which one you'll be going to i don't know my exact schedule yet i'm still waiting for more details from the team yeah, I think my, my dream race is to take part in Perry roubaix Yeah, it's just such a, an iconic race. And yeah, I would love to take part in the first women's edition. So fingers crossed for that one. Have you heard any more details about the Women's Hell of the North? I haven't heard too many details. I think it. I've, I've seen some posts of teams going to do a recon already. I think Trek was there with a few riders. And yeah, it just looks like it'll be a, a really challenging race. And challenging course how do you do on cobbles i think i can i can handle them okay have some some mountain bike and cross background so i think that helps we've spoken before about the pros and cons of having men's and women's races overlap but uh, what are your thoughts about perry roubaix does the women's edition get instant prestige because it shares a name with uh, another race that's um about 124 years old yeah, I think it is an interesting question. I think in this case, then yes, I think this this race will instantly gain prestige because it is just so well known and so iconic. Um, so it's a huge benefit to have have a women's event there as well. But yeah, I think we discussed in the past as well. I don't think it's it's not necessary for women's events to have to be held at the same time as the men's in order to be successful. But it doesn't hurt in some cases of these these really iconic and well-known races to kind of use that to boost the visibility of, of the women's side of the sport in a little bit more. You've raced the Tour of Chongmen Island in 2016 and finished second overall. What's that race like? Oh, yeah, Tour of Chongmen Island. Um, it's definitely a sprinter's race. Yeah, when I did it, it was three stages, and it's interesting. You do different laps around this this island, but then the finish line is actually kind of the same every day. So that's an interesting feature of the race. But it's definitely it's it's all about just pure sprinting there and sprinting for time bonuses and and things like that. So yeah, as a sprinter, I mean, it is also a, a great opportunity of a race to do really well. What about Canadian nationals? Road nationals are tentatively rescheduled for September. Is defending your time trial champions jersey a priority? Or would races like the Giro Rosa or even the World Championships in Switzerland take precedence? Yeah, it is a challenging question just because travel is so much more difficult at the moment. And yeah, it's not simple to, to just bounce around between continents for races. I mean, I would love to, to attend nationals and try to defend my title, but also need to be realistic that, yeah, depending on what my calendar looks like with the team, then I, I don't know if it will be possible to actually come back and compete. So I kind of need to wait and see. You've been racing professionally for more than 10 years, or around 10 years. You have a lot of race knowledge and experience and I'm wondering, though, are you still learning things within races or, or from races? Can you think of a moment, let's say, in the last year where you learned something new either about yourself as a rider or maybe just something about racing? 
yeah, I think I think this is why I'm still racing after so long because I learn new things every single race and I don't think you can reach a point where you just know everything about bike racing, which also makes it fun because you can always become better at it. I guess something I learned specifically last year could be I'm still learning a bit like when you know when's the best time to use or invest your energy in a race and and those moments where it really counts. And yeah, maybe one example last year was like, I raced uh, the Giro and I was super strong there and and really going for it every day. But I think reflecting back, it maybe wasn't in the right moments. And yeah, it didn't really create a result. Then I took that lesson. And then, you know, going to La Course the next week, um, I think I played it really smart and we had good tactics as the team and then I ended up on the podium so yeah it's just I think like I said I'm I'm learning still every single race how to become better I remember that edition of La Course you you did um, seem to attack at the right moment at the end uh, you're you're second behind Mariana Voss and I guess also some of it comes down to I imagine just having that database, that mental database of races to to draw from and then be able to reference them maybe more instinctually as as the situation sort of evolves on the road. Is that a fair assessment? Are your is the are your instincts developing constantly? Yeah, I think that is a fair assessment. Yeah, it's like the more past situations you can draw from then yeah, it's like you have faster access to that information and can respond faster in the future even if it's a I mean every race is a a different scenario but yeah your reflexes are a little faster in your your assessment. Leah Kirchman thank you very much for your time. Great thanks for having me. And that's the episode. It's put together by me Matthew Piaro. I had help from web editors Rob Sterney, Terry McCall, and Lily Hansen-Gillis. The episode is produced by Adam Killick. He composed the music, too. Thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. And thank you for listening. Please rate and review the show, ride safely, and I'll talk to you later.